Good morning, everyone. We're going to take just a minute and let folks get into the Zoom room, and we will be starting in just a moment. Good morning again, and welcome to today's webinar, The Importance of Dual Recovery with Mark Sanders. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Great Lakes MHTTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA under the following cooperative agreements. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speaker and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services in SAMHSA. The MHTTC network believes that words matter and uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. For more upcoming events and information, please follow the Great Lakes MHTTC on social media or visit our website. A few housekeeping items. If you're having any technical issues, please individually message me, Jen Winslow, or Alyssa Kuala in the chat, chat section, and we will be happy to assist you. If you do have questions for the speaker, please put them in the Q&A section on your Zoom toolbar, and we will do our best to get them answered. If captions or live transcript would be helpful, please use your Zoom toolbar to enable them by going into the More section select captions and show captions. At the very at the end of the session, you will be automatically redirected to a very brief survey. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the session in full. Please allow up to two weeks to process. The recording and presentation materials will be available on the Great Lakes MHTTC website within a week following the presentation. And I'm honored to um, have Mark Sanders be our presenter today. He is the state project manager for the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC. Mark has worked for 40 years as a social worker, educator, and part of the SUD workforce. He is founder of the Online Museum of African American Addictions, Treatment, and Recovery, and co-founder of Serenity Academy of Chicago, the only recovery-oriented high school in Illinois. Mark is also an international speaker, trainer, and consultant in the behavioral health field, whose work has reached thousands throughout the United States, Europe, Canada, the Caribbean, and the British Islands. Recent, Mark was named the 2021 recipient of the NADAC Enlightenment Award in recognition of his outstanding work and contributions to NADAC the field of SUD services and SUD professionals. He is also the recipient of the Illinois Association for Behavioral Health's 2021 Lawrence Goodman Friend of the Field Award in honor of the many years of dedicated service Mark has provided to communities throughout his home state of Illinois. Welcome again, everybody. Thanks for being here and I will turn it over to you, Mark. And thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Alyssa. And thank you, Sheree. And good morning, everyone. Presentations often begin with the polling of an audience. So by a show of hands, how many do outstanding work? Would you raise your hand and be really good at the work that you do? I'm very good. And how many of you feel as a result of the work that you do that you're making a difference in the lives of at least one human being, at least one person benefits from that work? Okay, good. And how many of you feel as a result of the work that you do that you deserve a $90,000 a year pay increase? Every hand goes up twice. Know that I know that the world cannot compensate you enough for the important work that you do. As a matter of fact, before we get deep into our content, I offer you two stories in, front, in the form of a gift in honor of the work that you do. In 1983, I had a job earning lots of money, $13,000 a year. I decided to go back to school so I could learn more, but also so I could make more money. So in order to do that, I took an evening job. I went from earning $13,000 a year to $10,000 a year. I don't know if you know what a $10,000 a year paycheck looks like. It's about $300 every two weeks. And I was given 150 of those dollars to the school I attended, Loyola University of Chicago, and $125 every two weeks to my roommate, which left me $25 every two weeks for pretty much nothing. In my field of study, social work, I did an internship of practicum. My first practicum was at a hospital. 
And the first day I showed up, I was asked to go home because I was wearing gym shoes. They said, this is the professional hospital. We don't wear gym shoes here. So where was I going to get a pair of dress shoes for $25? You're thinking Goodwill, Salvation Army. Years ago, there was a discount shoe chain called Favor Shoes. I walked into Favor Shoes, and the only shoes I could afford for $25 were plastic. The problem was that it was September. And as you know, it rains a lot in September. I quickly discovered that plastic and rain, they don't mix. I was slipping and sliding all over the place. And right around November, I had a larger concern. A hole formed right at the tip of the shoe. So now when I walked down the street, my shoes were talking. You ever had a hole in your shoe? In December, I'm frightened. As you know, in the Midwest, it snows a lot in December. My fear was that my snow would get in the tip of my shoe and I would die of frostbite. So I took my shoe to the nearest shoe shop. So after showing the counter, the owner looked at my shoe and he frowned and he said, you may as well throw these away, pal. These are plastic. We don't fix plastic. It's not worth it. He said, plastic can't be fixed. I put my head down. I walked about a mile. I stumbled into another shoe shop, sat down on the shoe on the counter. The owner looked at the shoe and he, he frowned. He said, throw these away, son. These are plastic. We don't fix plastic. It's not worth it. He said, plastic can't be fixed. Now I'm desperate. I walked two miles and stumbled into another shoe shop. Did the show on the counter. My heart was beating so fast, who was gonna say, we don't fix plastic? Plastic can't be fixed. Said he said nothing, he reached back, grabbed the magnifying glass, looked at my shoe really carefully. Then he looked at me and smiled and he said, I'll fix it. That was 1983. This is the year 2023. He's been fixing my shoes for 40 years. Not the same pair but he fixed those four times that year. What he said to me is it takes a special person to work at fixing something that the rest of the world says is not worth it, they can't be fixed. And that's the same thing a lot of people say about the clients you work with. It's not worth it, they can't be fixed. So it takes special individuals like you to dedicate your lives to doing this work. The second story was told to me by a good friend named Greg Risberg. He started off as a fourth grade teacher. The backdrop of his school was Robert Taylor Public Housing on the south side of the city of Chicago. He went from a fourth grade teacher to a social worker, to a motivational speaker. Greg told me that one day a man called him at midnight and woke him up and asked, are you the same Greg Risberg who taught fourth grade across the street from Robert Taylor Public Housing 30 years ago? Greg said, yeah, that's me. He said, I was a student in your fourth grade class. You were my teacher. I'm a decorated military man. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I wouldn't wind up achieving the rank of a Colin Powell. I was just calling you to tell you you really made a difference in my life. Greg said, what did I do? He said, every Friday you would stop teaching. You would sit the entire fourth grade class in a large circle. And you would have us to read the newspaper from cover to cover. And in reading the newspaper from cover to cover, what I learned was that there was more happening in the world than simply what was happening in public housing. So it made me curious about the world. I here I graduated high school. I joined the military. I went out around the world twice, he said. But you did something that was more special than that. One day, he invited the entire fourth grade class on a special field trip. He invited the entire class to your house. You asked the entire fourth grade class to bring a bag lunch to your house. And I looked in my refrigerator that night and I saw that I had no food. And when I made your house with no food, you went in your refrigerator and you fixed me a sandwich. Is there any way the reason I'm calling? Is because we still have a home in Chicago and I'll be coming home next month. And I wanted to invite you over to my house so I could fix you a sandwich. When he told me that story, it dawned on me that it took him 30 years to see the fruits of his labor. Those of you who work in mental health, substance use disorders, have clients with co-occurring disorders, you're like farmers who plant seeds, who may not see the fruits of your labor in the season that you plant the seed. Sometimes it takes many seasons to see the fruits of your labor. So I know that you do your work based in faith. Thank you for having that faith. Dr. Tornia Kane suggested that I share with you that as long as there's breath, there's hope. And in doing this work, I know you have lots of hope and lots of faith. So today we'll talk about the importance of dual recovery. 
in the midst of what we call Substance Use Disorders Recovery Month. So by way of an agenda, we'll talk about historical milestones that led to the celebration of Substance Use Disorders Recovery every September. Then we'll talk about the benefits of celebrating dual recovery. We'll take a look at varieties of substance use disorders recovery. We'll define mental health recovery. Put our brains together collectively, define what's meant by mental health recovery. My friends who work in mental health tell us it's easy to, uh, to define substance use recovery, but it's more of a challenge in defining mental health recovery. Then we'll talk about how professionals, you and I, can help clients define mental health recovery, maintain their recovery, have a sense of purpose in recovery, and then to celebrate that recovery, just like we do substance use disorders recovery. So we wanna find out who's with us before we get deep into our content. Would you find your chat feature and let us know what you do? What's the work that you do? We'll check in with Jen and see what you put in chat. Peer support, community case counseling, community-based counseling, mm -hmm. prevention education, care coordinator for behavioral health clients, recovery support, therapist at a mental health and SUD clinic, more peer recovery supporter, uh, mental health social worker, AOD counselor, manager of client rights and housing. So Jen, this is gonna be really helpful and thank you for sharing your, your occupation because that enables me to give examples based upon the work that you do. Okay, so happy recovery month. So let me let you know on a secret. Uh, during my introduction, it was mentioned that I have four decades of experience doing this work. And people ask me, how have you given four decades of your life to this work? Aren't you tired of doing all that paperwork? The answer is yes, I'm tired of doing all that paperwork. But the answer is that I never get tired of recovery stories. So here's one. There's a woman whose substance use disorder landed her in prison. And the first day she showed up at prison, the guard gave her a roll of toilet paper. She ran out by the second day and said to the guard, I need more toilet paper. The guard said, this is not the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. It was supposed to, to, um, to last a week. This is not the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, this is prison. Two years ago, I attended a conference and this woman was the keynote speaker and the conference was held at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. She's in recovery now for 10, for 10 years. She's a successful business owner and she regained custody of her children. I never get tired of a good recovery story. It's kept me going for decades. All right, so recent historical uh, events, which led to the celebration of substance use disorders recovery every September. The first is the crack cocaine crisis of the 1980s. Specifically, the year was 1986. How young were you in 1986? How old were you in 1986? Is there anyone with us today that wasn't alive in 1986? Raise your hand if you weren't alive in 1986. Jeffrey was not alive and Danielle was not alive in 1986. 1986 was a year that crack cocaine replaced marijuana as the number one street drug. In 1985, there was a stand-up comic named Richard Pryor from Peoria, Illinois, who was running down Santa Monica Boulevard on fire. Does anyone remember what happened? Richard Pryor was burning up. He was freebasing cocaine. And when you freebase cocaine, ether is used. And ether is very flammable. So he caught on fire. So in 1986, street scientists got together and decided that we needed a safer way for people to use cocaine. So they took out the ether and they replaced it with baking soda. And that was the birth of crack. The reason they call crack crack is because when baking soda is heated, it makes a cracking sound. May 29th, 1986. May 29th, 1986. I was giving my first speech ever. There was a knock on the door. Is there a Mark Sanders here? You have an urgent phone call, take it now. 
And my mother was on the other end of the line. She was crying hysterically. Have you ever heard your mother cry? She told me that my dad had just died in a closet at work and he was smoking a drug of his choice, cocaine. Found my dad dead in the closet. Next to my father was a cocaine pipe. Two weeks later, there was a basketball player from the University of Maryland named Len Bias. Who's never heard of Len Bias? He could be the best basketball player that many people have never heard of. As a matter of fact, in barbershops to this day, people still make comparisons. Who was better, Michael Jordan or Lynn Bias? They said that Lynn Bias jumped so high, if he went in the air on a Monday, when he landed, it was Tuesday. He was drafted number one by the Boston Celtics. He was going to be teammates with Larry Bird, right? And to be cele to celebrate having been drafted number one, June 15, 1986, by the Boston Celtics. He went to a party that night and celebrated, didn't then buy it, snorted cocaine, had a heart attack, and he died. Now, how close to the University of Maryland to where Lynn Bias, Congress to where Lynn Bias played basketball? It's right there in D.C. And after his death, Congress became angry and intensified the war on drugs. So we started hearing stigmatized language like crack addicts and crack babies. Native Americans suggested that I share with you, if you want to love something, call it a flower. If you want to destroy it, call it a weed. When we started calling individuals with substance use disorders crack addicts, and then their babies, crack babies, the prison population swelled, right? And lots of mothers lost custody of their children based upon stigma. Did you know? Did you know that after they took all the babies from the mothers who were addicted to crack cocaine, that research indicated that alcohol does more damage to the unborn fetus than does cocaine. That cigarettes actually do more damage to the unborn fetus than cocaine. But when stigma is high, my mentor, William White, said that there was a best day to have a substance use disorder in America. And that was September 13, 1978. And that was the day that First Lady Betty Ford went on national television and said, and I quote, my name is Betty Ford, I'm an alcoholic. When she made that quote, that, that, that statement, the First Lady of the United States, and she had alcohol use disorder, stigma was at an all-time low. 90% of Americans believed that substance use disorders were the disease that be treated in hospitals. Insurance back then covered substance use disorders treatment at 90%. But my friends, just eight years later, after the death of Lynn Bias, stigma was at an all-time high. Insurance companies went from covering substance use disorders treatment at 90% to 10%. And somewhere near 80 to 90% of residential, that is inpatient, substance use disorders facilities across the country closed. I promise you, whatever state you're accessing this webinar from, you'd be hard pressed to name over six inpatient treatment programs for substance use disorders in your state that have been open since 1986, most of them closed because of stigma. As stigma increased, and the war on drugs intensified, in 1985, there were 400,000 incarcerated individuals in U.S. prisons. By 1995, the prison population swelled to 1 million. By 2005, 2.5 million, mostly individuals with alcohol and drug problems. The face of addiction shifted from substance use disorders shifted from the first lady to African-American men living in places like the west side of Chicago and Compton, California, and Harlem and New York. Welfare involvement increased. And then in the 1990s in rural America, we had a methamphetamine crisis. One of my colleagues said that methamphetamines 
makes crack cocaine look like candy. In the 90s and early 2000s, there were all these raids of meth labs by law enforcement and, and babies were taken away. And these children were called meth orphans. Again, meth orphans, as uh, the Native Americans have suggested, if you want to love something, call it a flower. If you want to destroy it, call it a weed. Today, as we speak, we are in the midst of an opioid crisis all over the country, in metropolitan America, in rural America, and suburbia. There was a group that started to emerge called Faces and Voices of Recovery, led by many people in recovery, politicians like Patrick Kennedy, Kennedy, the Kennedy family, that have quite a few members of the family in recovery. And they said, the only way we can turn this around well, we went from treating substance use disorders as an illness, as a disease, um, towards criminalization of substance use disorders, is to show our faces. So they intensified National Recovery Month, right? To show the multiple, the thousands of faces, the 23 million faces of people in the United States in recovery. So every September we march, we rally, right? We celebrate recovery by showing our faces. And they decided that we could not afford to debate pathways of recovery, and that you are in recovery when you say you are in recovery. Let's celebrate together. So why celebrate dual recovery? Because substance use disorders and mental illness overlap at the rate of 50%, says Samson. I think it's even higher, right? As a matter of fact, the reason we want to focus on dual recovery is because the research says compared with an indiv to individuals that have a single diagnosis, of mental illness or substance use disorders, those who have both experience more evictions, more arrests, more hospitalizations, more suicide attempts, and actual suicides compared to an individual that has a single diagnosis. Also by celebrating dual uh, recovery, this can be a reminder of the importance of integrated approaches. There are three types of co-occurring disorders treatment. Would you take a moment to jot this down? There are three types of co-occurring disorders treatment. There's sequential treatment, where the person gets treated for their substance use disorder and their mental illness one at a time. That's called sequential treatment, one at a time. There is integrated treatment where the person gets treated for their substance use disorder and their mental illness in the same program at the same time, integrate. And then there's concurrent where the person gets treated for their substance use disorder and their mental illness in two separate facilities at the same time. For example, they might receive substance use disorders treatment on Monday and Wednesday, and then mental health treatment on Thursday and Friday. Okay, my friends, of these three types of co-occurring disorders treatment, which is the least effective? Of these three types, which is the least effective? Integrated, sequential, or concurrent? Any responses there in chat, Jen? Yes, everyone's saying sequential. And you are correct. Because a colleague of mine said to treat them one at a time, that'd be like a patient that has both cancer and diabetes. Treating diabetes and not treating the cancer. So by celebrating both together, it's a reminder. It can also reduce the stigma and reduce shame. You know what uh, the famous John Bradshaw says? that where you have substance use disorders and mental illness, there's a lot of shame, lots of shame, self blame. And shame hates exposure. It loves to hide in the crevices of the dark. By bringing it out in public and open, right? Reduce shame, we reduce stigma, reduce blame. Have you noticed that just about every time there's a mass shooting in America, mental health, mental illness is blamed? But by celebrating dual recovery, we're able as a nation then to see mental illness in 3D. And that's important. 
Mobilization can lead to an advocacy movement. Potential increase in dual disorders, mutual aid groups. I want to share with you a quick story. There was a woman in California who had bipolar disorder. She was assigned uh, or prescribed, I'm sorry, lithium, this medication for bipolar disorder. Her friends in recovery and substance use disorders recovery didn't know the difference between lithium and librium. You know there's a difference between lithium and librium. So they told her to stop taking it because lithium is a drug like librium, they thought. She stopped taking the medicine. She became extremely depressed and she committed suicide. Her friends in recovery responded to her death by starting an organization called MIRA, M-I-R-A. Back then it stood for Mentally Ill Recovering Alcoholic. But because that language is stigmatizing, they changed the name from MIRA to DDA, which stands for Dual Disorders Anonymous, a place where a person living with mental illness can take medication and not be shamed and stigmatized for it, while simultaneously addressing both their mental health and substance use disorders recovery. We need more of these types of groups. Inspiration to individuals in recovery, their family and frontline mental health professionals as we also celebrate mental health and dual recovery. We become inspired ourselves as people who do this work. So there are varieties of substance use disorders recovery. There's treatment assistant recovery, there's total abstinence. There's peer-based recovery like NANAA. And do you know there are some people who work in mental health who don't believe that 12-step groups work? Let me tell you a story about this flight attendant who developed alcohol use disorder, drinking those small bottles of liquor they used to serve on, on airplanes. Remember those small bottles of liquor, right? And she drank some liquor while working and her employer smelled liquor alcohol on her breath. She almost lost her job. She was forced into treatment. Shortly after treatment, she took a short flight from Las Vegas to the international airport in Los Angeles. When she got off the plane, she saw all that alcohol to her left. She was about to go and have a drink. Then she saw the person holding the microphone to her right she ran over to the person holding the microphone and said, will you make an announcement? The announcement was, well, all the friends of Bill W., co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, please report to Terminal 12. She said that within 20 minutes, 20 people from all over the world showed up at Terminal 12. She said they were friends of Bill W. They held a 20-person AA meeting right there at the airport at Terminal 12. You see, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, they answer the question, what do you do if you're craving crack cocaine at three o'clock on a Saturday night and your therapist is asleep and the mental health facility is closed? There's secular recovery, like Women for Sobriety. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that, um, that women have conversations with other women um, that are deeper even than the conversations they have when like men are around. Do they share stuff with each other as women? They don't talk about when men are around? Is that a yes or no? What do you think? Do women share stuff with each other that they don't talk about when men are around? Yes, yes. Those came in kind of quick, huh, Jen? First, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, my, matter of fact, I do a lot of speeches out of town. so. Sometimes I overhear conversations that women have with each other at airports. So I ask myself, one well, does, does my wife have those conversations with her friends when I'm not around? What do you think? You think she has those conversations too? Yes. So what we've discovered, thank you so much. You said that emphatically. So what we've discovered is that um, there's some women who are uncomfortable at mutual aid groups when there are bunches of men around. When I've been a drug counselor so long, I remember a time when there were all men in treatment. 
And the handful of women that would go to treatment back then, when they would come to groups, they would either sit close to the door or close to the group therapist. It took me a while to figure out why were the women coming to groups sitting near the door or close to the group therapist. They did, they did research that found that lots of these women had been traumatized by men. As a matter of fact, there's a woman by the name of Jean Kirkpatrick who started a program called Women for Sobriety. She had gone to the traditional AA meetings and had a hard time with one word, large lies in step three. She didn't have any problems with steps one and two, but only one word in start inside of step three of the 12 steps that had led her to start Women for Sobriety. So I'm gonna share with you the step. When you hear the word, would you put it in chat? Step three, we made a decision to turn our, 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 our lives and our will over to the care of God as we understood him. What's the word? God, higher power. The word? I would say him. The word is him. Because the research says that 70 to 90% of women that have substance use disorders were either sexually abused as girls or sexually assaulted as women, 70 to 90%. Women who specialize in working with women will tell you those numbers are more like 99%. In other words, there are some things that women might tell uh, a therapist that they may not tell a researcher. So Women for Sobriety is a secular um, self-help group. We mentioned secular because 12-step groups are higher power groups. Secular group where women can come together and support each other with their recovery. Listen to the first statement of Women for Sobriety. My name is Susan. I'm a competent woman. The first step of AA is my name is Mark. I'm an alcoholic. But women, we've discovered, are held to a higher moral standard, so self-esteem might be impacted greater. So claiming competence in recovery is a good thing. Did you know what they call a relapse in Women for Sobriety? A temporary setback. Then there's smart recovery. Smart recovery is a pathway of recovery where you don't have to say, my name is Jim, I'm an alcoholic. I have a, a friend of mine whose husband had alcohol use disorder. He couldn't bring himself to say, my name is Mike, I'm an alcoholic. I said, Mark, what do we do? I said, try smart recovery, where he didn't have to say it. He has it, but he's now in recovery for five years. Those of you who work with adolescents and young adults, do you know that most adolescents and young adults that achieve recovery, that their pathway is one drug at a time? For adolescents and young adults, one drug at a time. Dual recovery as a pathway of recovery. Moderation management. Medication supported recovery. Quantum change. Overnight sudden transformation like that. If I could just share with you just one amazing recovery story that happened like that. I was a counselor of a teenage girl. She was 13 years old. She smoked marijuana three times per, per day. I never met anybody who smoked as much marijuana as this 13-year-old girl. The only thing she loved more than smoking marijuana was the smell of marijuana. She so loved the smell of marijuana that you could put it in the, in the cologne, a perfume bottle and she would buy it. She wasn't much of an alcohol drinker. She didn't drink alcohol very frequently, but one day she went to a party where they were serving alcohol. And one of the things that we suggest to teenagers is a form of harm reduction. If, you, if you're gonna drink, watch your drink. She left her drink on the counter. And there was a street gang there. And one of the gang members slipped something in her drink, a pill in her drink, she passed out and the entire street gang sexually assaulted her. I said, how'd you know? She said, those fools posted it on Facebook. They were arrested. No, she didn't develop PTSD from the assault because she was passed out. 
And the only thing she remembers about that night was that she had smoked lots of marijuana before the party. So that smell that she so loved, she could no longer stand the smell of marijuana, right? Because every time she smelled the smell after that, it brought memories of something horrible happened to her. She hadn't smoked marijuana in a decade. Her recovery happened like that. Her father, who was the type of drinker, like my grandfather, that you wouldn't need a DSM to diagnose him as having alcohol use disorder. You could smell alcohol coming out of his pores. You ever met someone that drinks so heavy that you could smell alcohol coming out of their pores? That was her father. He said to me, if I wasn't intoxicated, there was no way I would have let my daughter go to that party at midnight at 13 years old. So he went to his church and kneeled before the, uh, before the altar and he asked God to remove the desire to drink from him. He hadn't had a drink in 10 years. It happened like that. Do you know the actor Samuel L. Jackson? Did you know that he had an addiction to crack cocaine? And that he was in treatment for crack cocaine. While he was in treatment for crack cocaine, he received a phone call from a movie director by the name of Spike Lee. Spike Lee told um, Samuel L. Jackson, I have a role for you. So Samuel L. Jackson left treatment for crack cocaine to play the role of a crack cocaine user in a movie called Jungle Fever. His girlfriend in the movie was Holly Berry, who also had an addiction to crack cocaine. And in the movie, if you remember, he would do this silly, ridiculous dance for his mother so she would want him to stop dancing. She'd give him money to buy crack. And during the rehearsal, he did that crazy dance. And the man who played the role of his father pulled out a revolver and shot and killed him. And Samuel Jackson said, the sound of the gunshot killed the active cocaine user in him. He hasn't used cocaine in 20 years it happened like that. So when I do webinars or presentations, I talk about a pathway of recovery called quantum change. And at every break, somebody comes up to me and whispers, that's how I got into recovery. It happened like this. And I say, why are you whispering? Because people wouldn't believe it, but that's a pathway of recovery. They're religious styles of recovery. They're cultural pathways of recovery. One that inspires me most is the Native American Will Bryanty movement. You see, my friends, Native Americans believe that a person can be sober and not well. So they have established this Native American Will Bryanty movement where these tribes are getting together and they're reclaiming the culture that was taken from them. And they're putting together 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60% recovery rates among some of the tribes and they're celebrating that recovery. There's another path for recovery that's called an unaffiliated. In other words, the person is not connected into any group of recovery, unlabeled style. They don't say my name is Jack. I, am al I have alcoholism. And they meet the criteria and they're in recovery. So there are all these pathways. And again, every September they come together, not to debate, but to celebrate. Then we know that there are challenges and celebrating mental health recovery, because how do you define it? So let's take a moment to chat. How are your clients, or if you're a recovery coach, those that you serve, how are they defining recovery for themselves, mental health recovery? How are the clients you're working with defining mental health recovery? You can put your response in chat. If you can't define it, then how do you know when you're what we're calling a relapse or like you're falling backwards or going back to like a previous baseline? Any responses there, Jen? Not quite yet, but people may still be typing. You know what that proves, Jen? It's not easy to define. So I suggest to you here 
that Samson's definition of recovery could be the bridge. Because SAMHSA uses the same definition of recovery from a substance use disorder as they use for recovery from mental illness. Process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and they strive to reach their full potential. Again, just like substance use disorders, mental health recovery should be individually defined, self-determined. So some clients define their mental health recovery is when they're no longer having symptoms or when they're able to manage those symptoms or when they begin to regain control of their life or they're living the life that they want to live or when their symptoms are less severe. Some will say I'm in recovery when I can have meaningful relationships, when I can work, when I have hope, when my life has meaning and purpose. You know, one of the individuals who's so inspirational to me is a woman by the name of Nanette Larson. Nanette Larson has a public story of bipolar disorder. She's also the director of rehabilitation services for the state of Illinois. Nanette Larson taught me person first language. Person first language, which reduces stigma. So for example, I went with her where she did a seminar in the audience were people living with schizophrenia. Living with schizophrenia, by the way, is person first language. Then at Larson said, you're not schizophrenic, you have schizophrenia. Should that be like somebody that has herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis and chlamydia, saying that they are herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis and chlamydia, there's more to you than that. She helps people discover their purpose in recovery. You're not an addict. You're a person with a substance use disorder, person in recovery, person in long-term recovery. She introduced me to a man I never thought I'd see this day. Because when I first started doing mental health work, all we thought in the 80s that people with mental illness wanted to do was pace the floor drink coffee throughout the day, right? And scratch lottery tickets. What we discovered, they too want to lead meaningful and purposeful lives. She did, introduced me to a man who told me he was living with schizophrenia and he still heard voices. And he was the executive director, executive director of a nonprofit organization that worked with individuals living with schizophrenia. And I asked him, what do you do when the voices show up? He said, I tell my voices to shut up, be quiet. I've got work to do. I'm on purpose. Who knew? A day like that would come. So you can help clients, those that you work with, those that you coach, recoveries, if you're a recovery coach, define recovery, maintain their recovery, identify purpose in recovery, and celebrate that recovery. So here we have a series of questions that you can ask the individuals you work with to begin to think about how they define recovery for themselves. We can ask, how do you find recovery? What are the signs for you that you're in recovery? How do you define dual recovery? What are the signs that you are in dual recovery? Just to get them to think about what's recovery for me. So helping those that you serve maintain recovery. Let's take a moment to chat. Um, how do you help the, the, the uh, individuals you serve maintain their recovery? Whether that be substance use recovery, mental health recovery, or dual recovery. What do you do now in your current role? Help those you work with maintain recovery. Still waiting a minute for Chet to come in. Yes. These folks are doing a lot, Jen. You know, the world can't compensate them enough for the important work that they do. Agreed. Somebody said support client in any way. Nice. Support them, coordination of care. You know, we have quite a few people who, who do that. Um, 
recovery coaching and case management. So you'll appreciate this, what I'm about to share with you. Okay. So Dr. Dr. Robert Drake talks about the four essentials. The four essentials are the opposite of enabling. When I first became a substance use disorders counselor, we use the word enabling a lot. We overuse the word enabling. As a matter of fact, what I was taught years ago, I said, if you help anyone with anything before they get into recovery from chemicals, then you're enabling. I'm going to suggest to you that mental health taught me something else. Robert Drake said, Dr. Robert Drake, if you have someone you're working with that has a dual disorder, that has a substance use disorder and mental illness, if you provide as many of the four essentials first, they will try to stop using chemicals, alcohol, and other drugs, stable housing. There's an evidence-based practice in mental health called housing first. A stable therapeutic relationship. A meaningful daily activity. Something that makes them want to get up every day, take a shower, right? Take medication if necessary because they're living, their, their life is filled with some purpose and a significant interpersonal relationship. You know, a friend of mine did some research on the number one reason that individuals with mental illness go to the emergency room for rehospitalization. The number one reason. Number two is discontinuation of medication. The number one reason can be summarized in the following story from the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. It's a book called Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. It tells the story of this father who had a little daughter. And for the first 12 years of his daughter's life, bedtime was always the favorite time of day for the daughter. Because the father would tuck the daughter in bed and say to his daughter, I love you, little girl. Boy, did she get, looks to be, get used to bedtime because her father would tell her that he loved her. One day when she was 13 years old, she brought two friends over. Dad said, I love you, little girl, in front of the two friends. This embarrassed her because she was a teenager. But because it was her father, she said nothing. One day when she was 22 years old, she called home for, for, um, to speak to her parents, and she was away at college, and her dad said, I love you, little girl. This sort of pissed her off because she was away at college, paying her own tuition, her room and board. Out of respect for her father, she said nothing. One day when she was 35 years old, she came by to visit for Thanksgiving dinner. So dad said, I love you, little girl. Dad, don't ever call me that again. I'm a grown woman. I'm my own house, my car, my kids. Don't ever call me that again. One day when she was 42 years old, her dad became ill. She rushed to the hospital to visit. And he, she was connected to, she was talking to him verbally. And he wasn't responding verbally. He was connected to a respirator. Feeling helpless, she climbed in bed with her dad. Put her, her head against his chest. Listen to the sound of his heartbeat. His heart said what he would have said if he could talk. His heart said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Little girl, little girl, little girl. She reported that when she left the hospital, the father wasn't cured. She felt better. It speaks to the magical power of love. But my friend's research indicated is that the number one reason that people get rehospitalized is a loss in a significant relationship. The way she did that research, she looked at a thousand cases, psychiatric cases in the emergency room of a hospital. Found that it was always a loss that triggered a return to the ER. Like that one client that I worked with who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was walking down the street one day and a friend said, my condolences. He said, for what? They said, we went to your mother's funeral. His siblings never told him that his mother died because of the stigma of his schizophrenia. So after his friend told him after the funeral that his mother died, he barricaded himself in his apartment, started drinking every day, stopped taking medication, and he wound up in the ER. Like that soldier came home from Afghanistan. He found that his fiance 
had moved in with his best friend. She was pregnant, and he and the best friend were having, and she and the best friend were having a baby. He threw away his medicine. He barricaded himself in his apartment and wound up in the ER. That was a young man who I worked with. He was 16 years old. He was hitting himself up his head against the wall. He had never did that before. I knew something was wrong. He saw his partner holding hands with one of his friends. Always a loss, right? And so one of the most important things we can do to facilitate mental health recovery, substance use disorders recovery, right? Dual recovery is connect people with those that care about them. Sometimes those bridges have been burned. Research says that you do better outreach than the clients themselves because you haven't burned any bridges. You're not tired going from one setting to another with you. We're talking about helping clients maintain dual recovery. Supportive employment is the number one evidence-based practice as preferred by people that have mental illness and co-occurring disorders. Intensive family case management, intensive family engagement, then the use of peers. Where would the world be without recovery coaches? We celebrate you today because your work is that important. Increasing medication compliance. Know that not everyone that has mental illness needs medication. Not everyone that needs med that has mental illness needs medication for life. But we work with lots of clients that take psychiatric medication. What helps? Increase medication compliance. Supportive employment. Work that gives my life meaning and purpose. Any efforts that we can put in place to reduce the stigma of mental illness. You see, I believe the psychiatrists went to medical school and have all of that education, not to just disseminate medication. They have a lot of information. So one of the best things I ever did was to uh, convince our psychiatrists at a program where I work to do a 45 minute educational group every day with the patients. Patients diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, et cetera, a 45 minute educational presentation every day on mental illness, the biological basis of mental illness, the fact that there's some varieties of mental illness that run in families, the brain, how diagnoses are made, medication, what medication does in the brain. And what we discovered is that as this, the clients were more educated about mental illness, the stigma of mental illness decreased and medication compliance increased. You know what helps increase medication compliance? Is when the client is working with a medicating physician that they like. The same is true for you. If you don't like your doctor, if you don't trust your doctor, you're much like, less likely to follow the regimen. But when you match the patient with a doctor that they like, you're more likely to take medication. When they have adult conversations with their medicating physician. You see, what makes medicine medicine is side effects. Let me ask you a question, yes or no. Have you ever been prescribed a medication, say for health reasons, that the side effects were worse than the benefits? If the answer is yes, would you just say yes? Some of you probably still have some pills in your cabinet right now, your medicine cabinet, from some medicine that you were prescribed in 1983, where the side effects were worse than the benefits. I had a client prescribed medication. He was 19 years old. He said, I'm not taking it. I'm not taking it. He said, it gives me diarrhea and constipation. Both? And it makes me impotent. He must have thought that I had lost to telling him to take medication with those particular side effects. He couldn't sleep. And what we learned is that when clients have adult conversations with them with their, with their doctor about the medication, the side effects of the medication, right? Other possible pills they can take. Adult to adult conversation increases medication compliance when they have a voice. 
one way to give a voice is to do what's called a cost-benefit analysis. What are the benefits of the medication and what does it cost? People are more likely to take it when the benefits are greater than the cost. If the costs are too great, maybe they can talk about another type of medication. A medication post previous hospitalization discontinuation of medication evaluation. How many times are you hospitalized for mental illness? On how many is occasions that you stopped taking the medication before? Just to gain that kind of insight. So one way that we can help our, those that we serve begin to identify goals and purpose in recovery is by helping them visualize the bright future. So I invite you to do with me a visualization exercise. Would you take a moment to get comfortable in your chair? If you're driving, don't do this exercise. What I'm gonna ask you to visualize, and I've done this a lot with clients to help them see their future in recovery, is an ideal day, a decade from today. So I want you to think about today's day. And that what you're gonna visualize an ideal day is 10 years from today. And everything you see, I'm gonna invite you to see in the ideal. There are three ways you can do this visualization exercise. Eyes open, eyes closed, or you can write. Eyes open, eyes closed, and you can write. Let us begin. It's 10 years from today. On this ideal day, I'd like to ask you to visualize yourself waking up in the morning. See yourself waking up in the morning on this great day. Does anyone wake up with you? Take a look at that. In the space where you wake up is a mirror. Take a look at yourself in the mirror. How do you look? If you're indoors, take a look outside. This is your ideal weather. Feel your ideal weather. When you feel that weather, you know it's going to be a great day. On this ideal day, your day, what's the first thing you do? You can do anything you want on this day. What's the first thing you do? And what do you do next? And then what do you do? On this ideal day, you sit down for a moment to reflect, just a moment to reflect. And what you reflect on is your life purpose. What is your life purpose? Would you take a look? Take a moment to reflect on the legacy that you're leaving the world. What legacy are you leaving the world? As a recovery coach, as a parent, as a therapist, friend, what legacy are you leaving the world? On the side of your day, you're at peace, emotional peace, spiritual peace. Feel how it feels to be at peace for a day. Even your physical pain has gone away on this day. No back pain, no knee pain. Feel how it feels to not have physical pain for a day. A decade from today, a decade from today, you have improved your finances. Take a look at your finances. They've improved. 10 years from today. On the side of the day, you stop for lunch. This is your favorite meal for lunch. What's on the menu? Who prepares lunch for you? And who, if anyone, joins you for lunch on this great day? You have lots of leisure time on your hands following lunch. What do you do with that leisure time following lunch? It's time for dinner. This is your favorite meal for dinner. What's on the menu? Who prepares dinner? 
And who, if anyone, joins you for dinner? What do you do with your leisure time after dinner? You can do anything you want. What do you do with the leisure time following dinner? Take a look. On this ideal day, what time do you go to bed? And what do you dream about? If your eyes are closed, we invite you to open your eyes. So, you know, often when I've done this exercise to get my clients we work with, I've done it with clients. They think about their purpose, goals, and recovery, and I pair them up in twos. And they talk about their ideal day. And what I notice is that their energy increases, right? Their voice elevates, right? Sometimes when people talk about their ideal day, their eyes get so big, you would think they had just smoked crack cocaine. Crack cocaine. There's a book that's called Optimism, The Biology of Hope. The author's research reveals that when people are optimistic, hopeful for their future, that neurochemicals are released in their brain. Some of the same chemicals that are released, released in a person's brain when they use drugs like cocaine and meth are released when they're optimistic about their future. We're talking about helping clients identify goals and purpose in recovery. Socratic questions like, what are the reasons you survived all of this? So my brother called me. It was, oh, January of 1996. He said, I have a drug problem. I said, I know. He said, I need help. I said, I know. So I put my young brother in detox for three days. He called me on the third day and said, I'm bored. Now what do I do? I said, go to a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous. So he went to his first NA meeting. And he called me in tears. I said, why are you crying? He said, after the speaker spoke at the meeting, I looked at the speaker and I said, you spoke the truth. I was there. I remember you. You spoke the truth. I was there. I remember you. The speaker is a man who used to use drugs and sell drugs with my father when my brother was a little boy. You spoke the truth. I was there. I remember you. The speaker went up to my brother and said, you don't know this, but as soon as your dad died smoking crack cocaine, I got into recovery. There's a famous expression that some people die so other people can live. He said, you certainly don't know this. When I was out there selling drugs with your dad, he saved my life twice. He said, so I often ask God, why did you help me? He looked at my brother and said, maybe one of the reasons that I was in so that I can help you. He was talking about purpose and recovery. He helped my brother and they both are in long-term recovery. What's the reason you survived that? When I've asked clients that question, they start talking about purpose. What would give your life meaning in recovery? You know, if I could ask clients one question, it wouldn't be that traditional social work question I was taught to ask as a social worker. It wouldn't be what brought you here, which is how you mess up your life. What brought you here? It'd be this next question. What is your previous life suffering preparing you to do with the rest of your life? That's about purpose. We could help clients set goals, smart goals. You know smart goals. We learned that as the people who do treatment plans. We can help them develop a personal mission statement. So along with goal setting, I've met with groups of clients to help them write their own personal mission statement in recovery. And then there's a life planning exercise, which is beyond the treatment plan, beyond the relapse prevention plan. These are important. Beyond the wellness plan. This is important. Wellness plan. What's your plan for mental, emotional, spiritual, and social growth? Life plan exercising covers all of these, the treatment plan, the relapse prevention plan, the wellness plan, but it also includes all of these things. It's a journaling exercise that I've done with clients. Unfinished business that you intend to complete. 
relationships that you plan to nurture, your life purpose, your mission, your happiness plan. So a friend of mine asked, met with the Dalai Lama. She met the Dalai Lama and asked the Dalai Lama about happiness. The Dalai Lama told my friend that people who live in the moment are the happiest. Dalai Lama told my friend that the past is often filled with regret. The future is uncertain, so it's often filled with anxiety. But the now is always okay. Think about it. Right now, we're in this webinar. Everything is okay. And you start thinking about your light bill and your gas bill. Or the argument you had with your spouse, your partner yesterday. And suddenly things don't feel okay. So what's your plan for happiness? 10 things you want to learn. 10 places you want to go. And things you want to own. How would you like to contribute? How would you like to be remembered? When I think about that question, how would you like to be remembered? I think about my uncle Isaac. After my father died smoking crack cocaine, my uncle Isaac went in front of a judge one more time. He said, Your Honor, I don't want to go to jail this time. I want to go to drug treatment. The judge said, why should we put you in treatment? You've been committing crimes since you were 10 years old. I'm looking at your rap sheet. He said, three reasons, Your Honor. He said, my father died as Rosa the Deliverance, drinking alcohol, that's my grandfather. He said, my brother-in-law just died smoking crack cocaine, that's my father. Third reason, Your Honor, you're right. I've been committing crimes since I was a juvenile. I know the job, I know the law based upon what I was accused of this time. You probably let me out of jail, out of prison in February. And it's cold in Chicago in February. I don't own a coat. I'll steal one and I'll see you in March. So the judge put him in treatment. He was the first person in our family to ever enter treatment. As he entered recovery, we now count 30 relatives in my family who are now in recovery. That's how he'll be remembered. Not about the crime, not about the heroin use, to transform my family's life. You're working with some clients right now whose recovery will change their family's life forever. Who do you ultimately want to become in recovery? So let us chat. What are your thoughts about how we can help the clients we work with celebrate dual recovery? Let's chat. Creative ways that we can begin to not just celebrate Substance use disorders recovery, and mental health recovery, but dual recovery. I'm sure people are still typing. Um, somebody said to really listen. Yes. Really listen, yes. Why is old Al sat on an oak? The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we be like that wise old bird? Really listen. Yes, what else? Hold space. Yes. Think of every reason to bring in a cake. That's right. Anything else there, Jen? Um, what if we, as a part of Recovery Month, also make sure that we honor dual recovery in the month of September? What if we, during Mental Health Month, Awareness Month, took that particular month, 
on and do a recovery. We see some other responses there in chat, Jen. A couple of people said be supportive. Be supportive, yes. So we can be supportive individually. We can have these uh, group celebrations. You know, a friend of mine, a friend of mine works in a residential facility with adolescents. And they've done some research that from the first time a person has ever had their first intake assessment for alcohol and drugs, it takes about nine years to put together one year on average of uninterrupted recovery. In other words, if you're working with someone that starts, has their first assessment at age 13, by age 22, they'll, have, they'll put together ongoing recovery. So what he does creatively, what he does creatively is every time the entire community of young people, not one person, the whole community, puts together a collective 100 days of abstinence. The whole community celebrates. And what they're learning is how to have drug-free celebrations. Now these young people are putting together years of recovery, celebrating small victories. Right? Not just gigantic ones, small victories. Uh, Jen, I'm going to check in to see if anybody has a question or a comment. Somebody else had mentioned to your last question to be nurturing and nourishing. To be nurturing and nourishing. Very good. Very good. Anyone have a question or comment? Not right now. Okay, so what I've learned over the years it's not so much anything I teach, but it's more about the action that you take. So I'm gonna ask you to chat with me one more time before we have our big close. All right, um, and then I'll pass it over to Jen after we have our big close, okay. All right, so um, what's the one action you're gonna take when this webinar is over as a result of the time that we spent together today? What will you do? as a result of the time we spent together today. Not so much what I teach, but it's more about the action. No matter how big or how small, what will you do as a result of the time we spent together? You can put your response in chat. Help clients dream and put feet to their dreams. Yeah, Langston Hughes said, hold fast to dreams where dreams die. Life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Help our clients to dream. Yes. Asked everyone I, ask everyone I come across how they are doing. Yes. Use the four essentials. Yeah, if we could house people, miracles will occur. Especially if it's stable. Somebody else has said that they're going to post the four essentials at, at their desk. Um, celebrate the small things. Check in with client to follow up with medication. Look into women for sobriety. Women for sobriety. I had a drinking problem that no longer has me. That's one of the 13 statements. Anything else there, Jen? Sharing meaning. Continue to be supportive. Listen more and engage keeping the four essentials up front. This is cool. Share the, share the information with my colleagues, visualize exercise, make sure my clients are getting their mental health and use the four essentials. Always check in on clients, be present, apply this information I've learned to every peer I work with. All right, so, um, so I'm gonna share with you a big story, right? Um, all right, it, it, the story really reminds you and I that we, we wanna continue to get better at what we do. Now, when I played basketball in high school, my coach said, every day you wake up, you either get better or worse. Every day, you never stay the same. What a sobering thought. Every day you wake up, you get better or worse. You never stay the same. It's a reminder to just keep getting better at what we do. It comes from a book called The Twelfth Angel. It's a story of a little boy named Joy who was picked to be uh, the, the 104th a little league baseball player in a draft of 144 little league baseball players. He was the last player selected out of 144 little league baseball players. In short, story had it. 
that Joey was the worst Little League baseball player who ever played Little League baseball. In his first game, he went up the bat three times. He struck out every, by, every time on three pitches. He went back to the dugout and said, day by day and every way, I'm getting better and better. In the second game, he struck out every time on three pitches. He went back to the dugout and said, day by day and every way, I'm getting better and better. Third game, he struck out every time on three pitches. Day by day and every way, I'm getting better and better. Fourth game, he foul tipped the ball behind him. He struck out on four pitches instead of three. Progress. Even though he struck out, he actually touched the ball. His teammates started saying, day by day and every way, I'm getting better and better. Fifth game, he hit the ball back to the pitcher. Of course, the pitcher grabbed the ball and threw him out, but this was the first time he'd ever hit the ball on the field. So went back to the dugout, and I asked you to say this out loud to yourself. His teammates started saying, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. The next game came, right? He hit the ball to the shortstop. First time he'd ever hit the ball past the pitcher. Day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Joy was on a really good team. His team made it to the championship game. He was the only player in the league that didn't have a hit the whole year. Uh, this team was losing one to nothing with a run on second base and two outs. Joey came up to the plate. He's saying to himself, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better, right? He swings, base hit, run around third and scores. Game is tied up one to one. Joey so excited. He hadn't been on base his whole life. He's jumping up and down, so excited. His teammates are saying, you can repeat it to yourself, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. He's still second base. They're saying even louder, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. The game is tied up one to one. Joey's on second base. Two outs. Next batter comes into the plate. He swings. Base at left field. Joey's rounding third. The ball's head towards home plate. He slides in the home plate. Safe. They win the game two to one. They carry him off the field. And everybody's shouting. Day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. I sincerely hope that in your personal life and in your professional life, that day by day, in every way, Things continue to get better for you. See, once a week, I encourage you to walk through the world with your head held high. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, look at her. She thinks she's a gift to the world. He thinks he's a gift to the world. You know what you are. You've been given the gift of empathy and, pa and compassion and patience and a caring heart. And you're using those gifts to make the world a better place. Thank you so much for all that you do. I'm going to turn our webinar over to Alyssa and Jen. Thank you so much. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. Um, I put some reminders in the chat. Uh, you will be automatically redirected to a very short survey. It, uh, those surveys are, help us um, to continue to provide free trainings to you all. So we greatly appreciate you taking just a few moments to fill that out. You will be receiving a certificate of attendance if you attended in full today. Um, we say that it takes up to two weeks to process, but um, more than likely that'll come much sooner, as will the recording and the and the presentation slides will be up on our Great Lakes MHTTC website shortly. So thanks again and have a great day. Um, and please check out our upcoming trainings and events. Thanks everyone.